Welcome to The Book Podcast, where we discuss books about the book, the Bible, with your hosts, Scott Moffitt, Gabriel Penfield, and Gary Karwaski. Hello, welcome to the 31st podcast of the book. Today, we interview an author who has written a comprehensive book on the judgment seat of Christ. I believe this is an important book that reminds every believer of what is at stake come eternity. Today, we live our lives in light of that coming eternity. Our great author today is our guest author, I should say, is Samuel Hoyt. Dr. Hoyt hails from Jackson, Michigan. He is a pastor and author. His educational background includes a BS from Michigan State, an MDiv and a THM from Western Seminary, and a THD from Grace Seminary. Dr. Hoyt has served as a youth pastor, an assistant pastor, and as a senior pastor, all in Michigan. And he did so from 1974 until recently. And now he's retired and living in outside of Atlanta, Georgia, correct? That's right. Well, we're excited to have you join us today. Welcome, Dr. Hoyt. Let's begin with the questions. The first question I'd like to ask you is, why in the world did you write this book on the judgment seat of Christ? Well, that's a good question. When I was in seminary, uh, Dr. John Whitcomb at Grace Seminary uh, taught a course on eschatology. And uh, in doing so, he assigned readings from various types of authors with different views. And as I read those views, I realized that there was just a paragraph or maybe a page or two on the judgment seat of Christ. And it was presented in such different ways that um, I talked to uh, Dr. Whitcomb about that. He said, that would be a great topic for your doctoral dissertation. So with that, I spent two years researching and writing on this subject. And uh, as a result, uh, Tom Stiegel, years later, founded the work and said, let's publish this. And uh, Warren Wiersbe uh, endorsed it. John Whitcomb endorsed it. Dr. Elmer Towns, who is co-founder of Liberty, gave me an endorsement. And it became a a book that was required reading at Liberty Seminary online for about five years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thrilled. There is the book. And uh, you can get it uh, through Amazon.com. There you go. We've all purchased it. Now you are a wealthy man. No, don't I wish. (laughs) Recently, I attended a church which labeled eschatology a secondary doctrine, which really kind of upset me. But you say in your introduction that a proper understanding of eschatology has far-reaching ramifications which affect all areas of the Christian life and conduct. Can you amplify, explain this to our audience? Uh, Yes. Uh, When you deal with the judgment seat of Christ, it brings three major doctrines together. It brings soteriology, the doctrine of salvation and what's included in that, and ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and eschatology, the doctrine of last things. They're brought all side by side uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. It has huge ramifications because the judgment seat of Christ involves an evaluation of all of our life and conduct, our motives, our our deeds, our words, and they're laid bare before the omniscient Christ. And so with increased knowledge comes increased responsibility in this life, and with increased responsibility comes increased accountability in the future. Hmm. Good. Yeah, awesome. Um, Reading through this book, I really... I really enjoyed it. I didn't can't say I've read I read every word. I skimmed a few chapters just because um ran out of time towards the end, but um definitely read the first few chapters, especially when it was talking about like when it would occur. 
because it does occur before the tribulation, after the tribulation. But going to question three, um, what purpose does the judgment seat of Christ serve for believers? Why is it happening? Uh, the Bible makes it clear that there are two predominant pers- uh, purposes. The first is present motivation for this life. Uh, listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, he says, do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. In other words, it should be a motivation to please the Lord because the Lord uh, wants to honor us and reward us for faithful service. The other purpose is future manifestation. Again, the Bible makes it clear that all of our life will be manifest before the omniscient Christ Mm -hmm. uh, to review and then to reward each of us individually. And so if I summarize the purpose, it would be for present motivation and for future manifestation in heaven in order to be rewarded. Hmm. That's excellent. You know, we've been doing some research on this particular topic for some time, and we recently did a review on those who think that some believers will be cast in some kind of uh, outer darkness during the millennium. Uh, They say that the judgment seat of Christ is a place of intense sorrow and terror uh, where their sins will be revealed, the entire entire assembled church, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth during the millennium. What's wrong with this view? I've read those books and articles too, and even listened to a sermon or two. Bible prophecy was not given to scare us, but to prepare us. And I contend this, you cannot understand the judgment seat of Christ without first understanding the other three judgments uh, related to the Christian. Let me just go over these as quickly as I can. You must, first of all, understand our judgment in Christ at the cross. Christ took the penalty, paid the penalty for all of our sin. John uh, 3.18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Romans uh, five one. Therefore, since we have been justified, declared righteous through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans eight thirty three. Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? Listen to Hebrews ten twelve and fourteen. But when this high priest Christ offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hebrews 10, 17, their sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 38, 17, you put all my sins behind your back. Micah 7, 19, you will again have compassion on us and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And then a simple New Testament verse that tells us what the cross of Christ accomplished on our behalf, Colossians 2, 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. Here's the six words we must remember. He forgave us all Mm. our sin. Amen. Judicially and forensically, a criminal to a judge. All of our sins have been judicially, forensically forgiven. So what's the conclusion? At the cross of Christ, All of our sins, past, present, future, confessed and unconfessed, conversion, uh, pre-conversion and conversion have been fully paid for. There's no legal charge that God can bring against those who are in Christ. So you have to have that nailed down. Or if you start with the judgment seat of Christ, 
you will bring wrong concepts about our sin to that judgment. The second judgment you have to understand is self-judgment of the believer. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 32, it's the communion passage. A man ought to examine uh, himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. But if we judged ourselves, we should not come under judgment. In other words, look at yourself. If there's sin, confess it. The next verse says, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. And so the second judgment is our own judgment. Evaluate your life, confess your sin. Now, if you don't, then there's the disciplinary judgment that Paul talks about and the writer in Hebrew talks about, where in Hebrews 12, uh, 10 and following, our fathers disciplined us for a while yeah. as they thought best, but God disciplines us for good that we might share his holiness. Now, verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. It seems like punishment, but it's not. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So the judgment for sin, all sin for all eternity, was paid for by Christ. If we sin, we need to judge ourselves and say that was wrong and confess it, 1 John 1, 9. If we don't, then God disciplines us, not as a judge to a criminal, but as a loving father to a disobedient son. Why? So that we will learn to do what's right. A chastisement primarily looks back, uh, does not primarily look back at the sin, but forward to the restoration. Uh, whereas punishment looks back at the sin. And so if we have those three judgments in our mind, we come to the judgment seat of Christ and can better understand what it is and what it isn't. Well, Dr. Hoyt, that answered a bunch of our questions. <laughs> yes. It um, did. Number, number five, I want to ask you this, and I'm, I'm going to reframe it a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to try to keep the answers a little bit shorter. And th that was my longest answer for the whole <laughs> program. If you met somebody and you only had one minute to speak to them. And they said to you, hey, I saw your book on a shelf. What's the thesis of your work about the judgment seat of Christ? How could you explain that to them in one minute? Or less. Or less. Or the less. judgment seat of Christ is a solemn evaluation at which there will be no judicial condemnation, mm -hmm. nor will there be any judicial punishment for the believer's sin, whether confessed or unconfessed, but rather commendation according to the Christian's faithfulness in this life. Good. There it is. Nice and simple. And maybe the next question will be pretty simple too, um, but we as I a pod... I don't think <laughs> we so. As a podcast, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to question five or question six. We as a podcast, literal, historical, grammatical, hermeneutic, right? Um, Amen. Doesn't mean every doesn't mean everything in the Bible is interpreted literally, right? Metaphors, similes, right? See plenty of those. But mm -hmm. what? why is this method important when you're studying judgment seat of Christ? Because we have to understand the words that the writers used in their setting. We have to understand the cultural norms around which they use their figures and events and words. And... Uh, that gives us the context to understand what the authors were trying to communicate in their culture. That should be the purpose of our hermeneutic. What were they communicating in a plain, literal, or figurative, literal statement when they wrote the book? Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you go right after this, uh, Gary, but I just want to comment. Like we learned about uh, Diocletian today and yesterday. We're going through Ooh. Revelation. So we learned about Diocletian, right? This really evil, really evil emperor, but it had a huge impact on these Revelation churches, right? And how Paul or and how John wrote to these churches, um, especially the ones going through a lot of persecution. But the the his, the history, the context is so important 
And like the more and more I read the Bible, the more and more I realize that. But Gary, what's our next question? Yeah, you know, it seems that there's a, a large contingent of scholars who hold to a general judgment theory that everybody's going to appear before the general judgment and be judged. Now, if you're looking at scripture, you're going to say, where do you find this? Mm -hmm. There are multiple judgments. Let's kind of def let's kind of de take apart this idea of a general judgment, which the vast majority seems of scholars hold to and tell them why they're wrong. I'll be glad to. <laughs> uh, they believe that there'll be one resurrection and one general judgment at the end of the age before the eternal state. And they believe that both believers and unbelievers will be resurrected and judged at the same time. But the Bible makes it clear that there are more, if you can prove that there's more than one resurrection and judgment, then the general judgment theory fades away. If we were to look at uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, and Revelation 7 through 14, you can see that there is more than one judgment and one resurrection, if I may, these verses. Uh, in, in Revelation 24 and 5, the Apostle John writes, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this is before the millennium at the end of the tribulation, the resurrection and judgment of the tribulation saints. And then the next verse, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. And so here is one clear passage that there are at least two separate, and there's more, two separate resurrections and two separate judgments. If you take the plain literal teaching of scripture, the general, the general judgment theory falls apart. There you yeah. go. There you go. I thought it was interesting. You talked about the reformers and um, you lauded them for their work on soteriology, the sinfulness of man. But you state that they made some critical errors in their work on eschatology. Can you share with us where these guys went off the rails? Yeah. Uh, in the early church uh, with the Apostle Paul and uh, the Apostle John, they believed in a literal millennial kingdom. But when Origen came along with his oh. allegorizing of scripture, trying to find the hidden meaning, it went off the rails. And then Augustine picked up from where Origen was uh, left off and uh, embraced it in his theology, especially when it came to eschatology. He was right in a number of other doctrines but when it came to eschatology, he spiritualized uh, the millennium. And then we go into the dark ages where there wasn't much research being done. And it brought us to the time of the Reformation where the theological acceptance continued on by way of tradition all the way back to Augustine. And so he, they continued to spiritualize uh, the millennium even though they reformed doctrine in terms of uh, salvation by faith alone and sola scriptura, they did little with eschatology. And it didn't happen until uh, Darby, John Darby in the middle of the 1800s, when he took the basis of scripture alone, studied himself and said, taking the literal figurative, gram literal grammatical historical interpretation, the judgment, general judgment theory doesn't hold up. And so he recognized a literal millennium and then a literal judgment seat of Christ. And from there, scholars have gone on to research it more. Whoa, so that's whoa, where it got whoa. off the rails. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Does that mean that premillennialism mm -hmm. is a relatively new theory that just popped up around the time of Darby? What's there, up with that? I, I can say, Gary, absolutely not. The mm -hmm. Apostle Paul and Apostle John uh, believed in a pre literal premillennial return of Christ. That's pretty early. He would set up a literal kingdom on earth. And so 
It's not a new theory. It goes all the way back to uh, the apostles and the early church before Origen. It was he who changed the approach to interpreting scripture. And then it became tradition to hold to that spiritualized method. Mm, gotcha. All right. So we talked about the two judgments. Uh, we're going to um, question, question 10. Allah. Yeah. So what exactly are the differences between the two judgments? I guess, what are the texts that we use to support each position? Who is involved in each judgment? But like, what's the main the main okay. difference Be- between the general judgment theory and the judgment seat of Christ? Mm. In the in Revelation chapter 20 and verses four and five, again, it said that uh, those who had been martyred during the tribulation will come alive again. And it says, uh, and they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But then skip down to verses uh, 14 through uh, 11 through 14. It says, when the thousand years was over, Satan will be released and go out to deceive the nations. Then I saw a great white throne and on him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. Each was judged according to what he had done. Mm. Two separate judgments, the tribulation saints and then the wicked dead, Hades and death gave up their dead and they were judged for eternity. And it says they were thrown into the lake of fire. So they are two very different judgments. Mm. I'm going to skip to uh, number 13. Mm. The, judgments, the judgment seat of Christ is also called the Bema. It yeah. has um, different etymological and cultural cultural trails that we can follow. Can you speak to the differing Greek and Roman I- ideas behind this Bema or judgment seat? Yes. First of all, it's regrettable that our translator translators in the past have used the word judgment seat Mm -hmm. to translate a simple four-letter Greek word that we uh, transliterate bema or bema. Mm -hmm. It simply means a raised platform, uh, a podium, a raised bench. And in the Greek culture, it was often used of uh, the judges who viewed athletic games um, and Paul used this word in writing to the Corinthians because the Isthmian Games, an athletic competition, much like our Olympics, was held every two years. And the judges who oversaw the games to make sure the contendants uh, competed according to the rules sat on a raised or elevated platform. And that's what bema means. The root word is binos, it's which simply means raised. I know, yeah. And so Paul said in um, 2 Timothy 2.5, if anyone competes as an athlete, like they do in the Isthmian Games, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules, because the judge is watching and evaluating. When it came to the Roman Bema, because of their legal system, the word was often used uh, in... Uh, the official courtroom where the magistrate or judge sat. Again, overlooking the proceedings, the basic idea is a raised platform of prominence or dignity. Mm. And that makes a big difference talking about um, the Olympic Games, because like if you're just looking at the text, you have no idea that context. You don't know Bema, you don't know yeah. or Bema, you don't know about the Olympic Games, Roman, Greek. Like you have no idea that, that it's referring to that. So, like knowing this context really makes a difference. Um, it does. That's think, why studying the history around these words is important. In my two years of research, I gained so many insights regarding the true nature of the Bema. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I want to skip a little bit ahead to, question 18, talks about Luke 14, 14. Um, It's a question I had. The Old Old Testament saints, they obviously didn't live during the church age, right? Church age started at Pentecost. It's going to end at the rapture. Um, But Luke 14 to 14 is talking about Old Testament saints being judged. Um, Are they going to be judged during the same time as the church? Um, Or are they going to be judged at a separate time? 
What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts, they will have a separate judgment. We're told about the rapture of the church in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, with a shout, and uh, we'll be raised with Christ. Israel, as we know it, will go through the tribulation. And uh, there are Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 talk about times of great distress as the world has never ex experienced. Mm. But then there will be the resurrection of the believing Old Testament saints who will then go into the millennium to enjoy all of the promises, the, mm. the unfulfilled promises that were promised to Israel as a nation. And so I believe the resurrection of believers in this age and Old Testament saints are separated by about seven years. The mm. beginning before the tribulation, the Christians will be raised at the close of the tribulation when Christ comes back to establish his millennial kingdom, Old Testament saints will be raised. Mm. Good to know. Oh, my goodness. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about the raptures before the tribulation. We're talking about the judgment seat of Christ happening during that seven-year tribulation somewhere. Where is it happening? Who's the judge? Who are the ones that are standing before him? And is seven years long enough for all of this judgment to happen? Okay, that's a pile of questions right there. Uh, who are the judged at the judgment seat? All Christians from Pentecost until the rapture. Who is the judge? It's Jesus Christ in John 5, 22. It says, moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. And then in verse 27, and he has given authority to judge because he is the son of man. So Jesus Christ will be the judge. And what was your other question? Oh, I, how, how can it all be done in a short period of time? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, George Ladd made what I would consider a ridiculous statement. Uh, he said that he argues that there, let's say there's 200 million living Christians and there's about 200 million seconds in seven years. He said then each Christian would only have a fraction of a second for the judgment. How is that possible? Well, the enormity of judging every Christian with all of his spiritual gifts and opportunities and talents and so on depends on an omniscient God. If God could create in six days the universe with billions of stars, the planets, the earth, everything on the earth and everything in the earth, and all of the fishes and all the birds and all the animals and, and man in seven days, he certainly can evaluate all the Christians in within seven years. Some believe it will be instantaneous. Some believe it will be three and a half years, some seven. All I can say with, a, with certainty is it's within seven years. And picture a graduation of a large university. In a relatively short period of time, all of the students in that graduating class graduate and all are recognized for their achievement, for the grades that they have made in the past, the academic achievement that they have made, and they are individually honored, but in a short period of time. And God, who is omniscient, uh, is able to do more than any university. And all of us will have an individualized evaluation all within that period of time. I love Deuteronomy 29, 29, when it comes to God's methodology. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. The secret things. We can't figure out God. That's all right. They belong to him. We better act on what we know is true. I'm going to combine uh, question 23 and 24 a little bit. Um, some in our camp talk about the issue of unconfessed sin, which you've touched on already a little bit. 
But my question is, if there is unconfessed sin and the believer, according to their scheme, has to be has to be punished for that sin somehow, you know, now not using our understanding of Christ died for our sins, past, present, future, but that unconfessed sins must be punished. Isn't that kind of like violate the law of double jeopardy? Absolutely. Either Christ paid for all of our sin, Colossians 2.13, but it says Christ forgave us all our sins, or he didn't. If they argue he didn't, then that implies that I must somehow judicially pay for my sin. How can a human satisfy an infinite God? And then it is double jeopardy because... It's not true. God, uh, Christ didn't pay for all of our sin. He did or he didn't. You can have it both ways. When it comes to unconfessed sin, the judicial penalty for unconfessed sin has been paid for. The issue of unconfessed sin has to do at the judgment seat of Christ because I was unfaithful in continuing an unconfessed sin I lose the opportunity to gain reward in that area had I been faithful. Hmm. Yeah, and you talk about um, retribution versus restoration. I believe it is question 26. But um, when it comes to restoration, I mean, life's going to be over. It's going to be done. Like, is it restoration in that sense or like what's the difference between retribution versus restoration? I use those terms in my book in relationship to discipline, mm -hmm. God's disciplinary judgment, which has only to do with this life. There are those who try to apply it to the judgment seat of Christ. No, we will be in our glorified body. There's no reason to be disciplined. Discipline mm -hmm. in this life is so that we might take uh, become partakers of peaceable fruits of righteousness. Yeah. Retribution has already been right. taken care of at the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The gospel requires the cross. There are some people who say, do you believe in a crossless gospel? No, there's no good news without the cross Amen. where Christ paid the full penalty for all sin forever. Yep. You talked about the difference between punishment, looking back, yeah. versus um, discipline, which is looking forward. Forward to learning. Let me give you a quick little illustration. Uh, discipline can feel like punishment. When mm -hmm. our youngest son was three or four years old, he did something naughty. And so I took him into the study, closed the door so I wouldn't discipline in front of the other children mm -hmm. and said, this is what you did. That was wrong. It's naughty. I pulled down his pants. We took a wooden yardstick and cut it in two and had half of it downstairs and half of it upstairs. <laughs> and I got a hold of it, pulled his pants down and said, Paul, I want you to learn that it is painful to disobey. And so I gave him a few swats. He cried. I hugged him. And I said, you know what you did wrong? He said, yes. I said, will you do wrong again? No, daddy. No. He walked out 20 minutes later, he came back in and looked at me with a big smile. He said, Daddy, can I sing you a song? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, Paul. He said, my heart says, I love you. My heart says, I love you. Mm -hmm. Daddy, you know what? My heart says, I love you. That was discipline. <laughs> that he might learn to do right mm -hmm. and that he might uh, turn from evil. And that's what God's discipline is, so that we might learn to do what's right and love our Heavenly Father even more. That's awesome. How many uh, kids do you have? We have three. Three. And then grandkids? Eight. Eight. Oh, kids. my that's goodness. Awesome. I know. I think that's all we're going to get. But uh, mm. we love them all. They're all wonderful. That's awesome. Gary, do you have anything? Next question. Oh, really? Is it my turn? <laughs> I can go. Uh, we're looking. Bring it on, Gary. What, what, what question are we dealing with? I think he uh, fell asleep already. <laughs> yeah, I did. It, when you get to be my age. All right. Um, let's go to question 29. First Corinthians 11, uh, verses 30 to 32, mm -hmm. is essential to understanding the difference between confessed 
and unconfessed sin. Let's talk about that just a little bit because I think a lot of people get hung up on this idea that if I have if I die and I have unconfessed sin, I'm going to have to pay for that. And I want to be very clear with our audience and our listeners that that is not the case whatsoever. Exactly. Unconfessed sin has to do with this life. And if we, let's go through the three judgments. Christ paid the full judicial penalty for all sin. If we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't be disciplined. If we don't, then we have unconfessed sin. And God teaches us in one way or another that it's going to be painful to uh, live that way. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 30, 30 through 32 that uh, you referred to, Paul says, that is why many are weak and sick among you and a number have fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. But if we would judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Some of God's methods of uh, disciplining is through physical hardship. But he has many other ways, financial hardship yeah. and uh, anything that's painful to get our attention to say it's not worth sinning. Let's repent. Let's ask forgiveness and choose to do what's right. Yeah, I think that 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 passage is important because it's the Lord's table. And that's where you're supposed to be right with God by admitting those things that you've done that have harmed him. And if you rightly judge yourself, you don't have to face any kind of discipline in this life. You've already taken care of it. As 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, mm -hmm. he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But, but let, me just, let me just say this. Mm -hmm. Let me just say this. At the judgment seat of Christ, unconfessed sin is, is not the issue. Right. Unconfessed sin is simply that we lost the opportunity in this life to gain reward had we been faithful in that right. area instead of sinning in that area. That leads to question 30. And uh, I think it was important that you said early on that the judgment seat of Christ is really a, 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 a remiss. It's a misnomer. It's not it should be the reward seat of Christ or something like that. Yes, because it's the BAME of the race platform where uh, right. rewards are given. It's but the place life where is the, evaluated. It's the place where the Christians evaluate, right. you know, and it is a question of our service and faithfulness to him is what you state in the book. Yes. So what's the purpose then with those criterion of the evaluation or the judgment at this BEMA seat? It keeps us moving ahead toward the goal. Uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13, not that I've already attained all this, or have I already been made perfect? I have not arrived, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, and I want you to do the same thing, forgetting what's behind We've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. We've all had failures. But straining toward what is ahead, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so it ought to cause us to press on in spite of all opposition, in spite of failures in the past, to be faithful today. I can only live my life today with the choices that I make. Honor the Lord today and press on. You only get one shot at it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me push back a little bit against this. Uh, question 33. Um, it talks about, let me read it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bama seat, so that each one may be uh, recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good, right, rewards, or bad. Can you explain why it talks about bad there? And there's other passages that kind of refer to um, that aspect, but. Okay, uh, be glad to. You need to know a little Greek uh, in yeah, order to do. understand because the word for bad is not the usual word for bad in terms of evil or corruption or wickedness. That's kakos yep. or panaros. The mm -hmm. word here is phalos, which means simply 
good for nothing, good for nothing. And that's what Paul was referring to in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when he said that your work will be evaluated, whether it's gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, hay and, stubble. and stubble. The fire will test it to see what sort it of what sort it is. Is it worthless and just burned up? If you have a huge stack of hay, dry hay, light a fire to it, it won't take long for it all to be burned up. It's worthless. And so Paul is saying here uh, that you may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or worthless. So it's a question so make of a value. Decision. Don't okay. waste your time living yeah. for worthless things. I think of this generation that's on their iPhone three, four, five, six hours a day, reading all the texts, all the postings, and everything else. Day after day, week after week, now year after year. Yeah, it's true. What does that contribute to their lives or to the cause of Christ? I think this generation is facing the, the challenge of having so much of their lives evaluated as worthless for reward. Mm, Ephesians um, reading today. Ephesians 5, 15, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. That's right. I think that speaks into a lot of what we're dealing with today. Right. Mm. All right, let's go back to this. Uh, I'm, I'm on 35. Uh, the believer's works are be, but be do, to be done with pure motives, pure methods, spirit and power, and word directed. Ouch. <laughs> what person? How do I know that all those things are in place when I serve God? Isn't there a bit of a selfish motivation on my part as well no. to say, you know, I'm going to serve to get receive uh, rewards? And is that a pure motive? Is that a pure method? Is that spirit empowered? How do I know this? Or is this just something that God knows? No, I believe that all of our work need to be done according to the word of God the principles of the word of God and the will of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and for God's glory. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, it says that he will judge the thoughts and intents of the heart, the motives of the heart. And so he knows the motives behind what we do. Uh, when we have selected obedience, that is simply disobedience. And so our lives need to be lived uh, an open book, knowing that God sees everything we do, our thoughts, our words, our motives. And we have a choice, what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, and how we're going to do it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about rewards and punishments. And I sat in a Sunday school class once when I was out of the ministry and the people there were totally convinced that uh, once you got to heaven, you tossed your crowns at Jesus's feet and that was it. You were done with your rewards. Now everybody's just equal. So my question is, are rewards in heaven and hell equal between peoples or are there different, um, different levels of punishment? Are there different levels of reward? And um, do, how long do these rewards last? Okay, great question. Uh, no, all rewards are not equal. Jesus made that clear when he gave us the parable of the pounds. Remember, he gave the parable of a nobleman going to a far country called 10 servants in front of him before he left and gave each of them a pound. And he said, go and uh, trade and engage in business while I'm gone. When he came back, he called the 10 servants before him. One servant said, well, I've gained 10 pounds with the one pound you gave me. And Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge over 10 cities. The other man said, well, sir, your pound has earned five more. And Jesus said, uh, you take charge of five cities. It shows us there's different uh, levels of reward. And I've said in the book where there is equal ability and equal opportunity, but unequal faithfulness, there will be, the reward will be graded. There, in fact, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.8, Paul says, 
the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his labor. In other words, there's different degrees of reward according to our labor. Well, what about punishment in hell? There's, I don't fully understand this, but I can declare what the Bible says. It sounds like there will be different levels of punishment in hell, even though all of hell will be hell. Because in um, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and following, it said the, the dead will, the judge, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And then it says the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Hell will be hell for everyone, but it mm. seems to imply that there will be some even greater measures of suffering. Uh, we've heard it said, for, for this serial, serial killer, hell can't be hot enough. <laughs> well, I think so, because they will be judged according to their works, the Bible says. So I think there's gradations of reward and gradations of suffering. So then what you're saying is, I can look forward to eternity with great joy and happiness because my reward will be great because I've gained a lot more than 10 pounds. <laughs> well, yeah, I understand your pounds, but let's go. You know, oh, it's those are different pounds. pounds. Oh, no. Hermeneutic that says a pound was a measurement of money back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. After, com after coming to Word of Life, I didn't quite hit the ten pound mark, but it was a <laughs> it was a few lbs too. Yeah, but uh, Hebrews six ten speaks to um God, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward His name, in having ministered and is still ministering to the saints. Right. Thank you for bringing that up. This is one of my favorite favorite verses. Excellent, excellent. Because I've been serving the Lord all of my life. I possibly, it's impossible for me to remember everything I've done, all the sermon preparation, the sermons I preached, the funerals, the weddings, the counseling, the giving of money. I've done uh, 80 international ministry trips. I can't even remember what I said at some of those. Mm -hmm. But listen to this verse again. God is not unjust. He's not unfair. He is totally fair. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Even though my memory bank is devoid of much of what I've done to serve the Lord, it's on the front of God's screen at the judgment seat of Christ, and I will be rewarded accordingly. So to me, that's the cheerleading verse. Keep going, keep going. God will not forget, even though you may forget. Yeah. You see kind of a little bit of standard of uh, rewards there, right? The ministry. How are we? And it doesn't have to be like a pastor, right? Pastors are ministering to others. Yeah. Counselors are ministering to others. But as Christians that aren't pastors, as believers that are part of the uh, the laity, right? The Just the church going people. No, everybody is ministering to others, right? As pastors, our goal, um, your goal is to teach others how to teach others, right? Making disciples who make disciples, right? It's not just the pastor's job to go and serve. Um, it's everybody's job. And that's one standard of judging. But um, looking at question number um, uh, 40, what are the other standards of Christian judgment? Okay. Is we're we looking at like fruit of the spirit? Is that a standard? Are there other standards of judgment? Like what is God judging? Uh, what's What is he looking at as he judges believers? Great question. The fruit of the Spirit primarily deals with the character qualities of the Christian, love, joy, mm. peace, long-suffering, all of which ought to be present all the time in the believer. But the judgment seat goes beyond just who we are and the character we have. It involves what we do. So in the book, I try to take three broad areas, standards for reward. Uh, the first of which is the servant. Was he disciplined? 
Mm. Was he disciplined in his moral realm, in his spiritual realm, in his physical realm? Because Paul uses 1 Corinthians 9.25 to say this, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, is self-discipline. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So mm. he's speaking about self-control, self-discipline. The servant was a discipline. The other Another uh, standard is stewardship. Was the stewardship discharged faithfully? Mm. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, Now it is required that a steward be found faithful, a steward of my spiritual gifts, a steward of my talents, a steward of my opportunities. Am I faithful with what God has given me in trust? And then the third standard is the service, will it abide? What was the motive? Was it done through the power of the spirit or in the energy of the flesh? And so I think those are three major areas uh, that are standards. Uh, the servant was a disciplined, the stewardship was a discharge faithfully, and the service, will it abide? What was the motive? Mm. Uh, and was it done in the power of the flesh or through the energy of the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, I'm going to go down to uh, question 42, the issue of shame. Uh, there is a lot of discussion on this issue. Uh, how are you going to, what are you going to, when there's a loss of reward? Okay, so we're talking about 1 Corinthians 3. All this stuff is burned up and there's not much left. Uh, is the believer going to feel shame? And is the, where does this shame come from? Does the shame come from the judge, who is Jesus Christ? Does the shame come from ourselves because of loss of reward? What about this issue of shame at the judgment seat? Gary, you like to ask hard questions, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we do a little research into the original language, uh, where in First um, John 2.28, it says, Now, dear children, continue in him, keep being faithful in Christ, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed, not mm -hmm. means don't shrink back with shame. Mm -hmm. In the Greek, it's in the passive voice. And the passive voice is ambiguous. Who is causing the action? Yeah. Is it our own reflection that causes us to shrink back in shame? Or is it Jesus Christ shaming us? For our lives. Well, the common use of the passive voice is for the subject that's being talked about. It says, my dear children, don't shrink back. I don't want you to have to shrink back with shame. Uh, I believe we'll have memory in heaven. And just like with Peter, after he had denied Christ, well, Jesus was arrested. He was taken to the home of the high priest. Peter showed up and then began de denying Christ three times. Once he denied him three times, the uh, rooster crowed. And it says that Jesus looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus didn't rebuke anything. He simply looked into the eyes of Jesus. And I thought, oh, no, I failed. When we're in heaven and look into the eyes of the Holy One, there could be some measure of shame and remorse. But we have to realize that is not the predominant view of heaven. Peter did not weep and cry the rest of his life. He realized that he had made a mistake. Jesus called him to serve him, and he went on and served him faithfully. If we have a sense of shame, it is not from Christ, because he paid the penalty for all of our sin. It's by personal reflection. And yet, I believe it's for a limited time. It's not the overwhelming emotion of heaven, because Jude 24 says this. To, whom, uh, to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great, great joy. joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right there is what heaven is all about. 
not shame, not remorse, but great joy. There could be some measure of remorse when we first see Christ and think, oh my goodness, look at the opportunities I've missed in here's All I did, not worthy of reward. It's temporary, it's limited. The overwhelming emotion is great joy. Yeah, I, I also include Genesis 3, the fall of Adam with that. They hid yeah. themselves from God because they felt shame right. themselves. And right. It was God that went out looking for them. Just so, said, where are you? Yeah, where are you? So we do it to ourselves. That's excellent, right. excellent answer. I like that, Sam. You're getting really passionate, pounding on the pulpit again. <laughs> yeah. Real good. Well, let's kind of talk about shame. Let's talk about the better stuff. What are the rewards that the believer is going to get when they arrive in when they arrive into Christ's presence at the judgment seat of Christ? And what are the crowns that are people are always talking about? Okay, uh, in my book, uh, the judgment seat of Christ, I give a chapter to the general rewards and another chapter the crown rewards. And so, if you get the book, you can read in detail about that. But here are some of the general rewards sure. that the Bible talks about: praise, honor, glory, abundant entrance treasure, inheritance, reign, privileged servant, service. His servants will serve him. That's part of our reward. Mm -hmm. And then there are five crown re rewards that are mentioned in the New Testament, the incorruptible crown, which is often called the victor's crown, uh, the crown of rejoicing. Paul said that the Philippian believers were his crown right. of rejoicing. In other words, the soul winner's crown uh, then the crown of righteousness for those who love his appearing, the crown of glory, we say it's the pastor's crown, where yeah. you read in uh, uh, First Peter about the pastor, and then the crown of life, the sufferer's crown. Now, there might be more crowns, but this is a sampling of what the New Testament talks about as crowns. And in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, Jesus said, behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So Jesus is ready to reward us, and it's going to be according to what we have done. Hey, look at the cover of your book. There is a crown right on the very cover of the book. Amazing. I look wonder at, how it got there. Look at that. <laughs> All right, we're running out of time, but I want to get to this last thing, which because I think it's really important. Are all believers overcomers? Um, or are there two categories of believers? Some who are not overcomers and some who are overcomers. Mm -hmm. And there's a very critical verse in First John on this, so that I want to be sure we pick up on. So um Gary, I'm not going to disappoint you. I will pick that verse up. I knew you would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible was not given to scare us, but to prepare us for what's coming. There are not two classes of Christians, the overcomers, which walk faithfully with the Lord, and non-overcomers who are living carnal lives that will end up with a gnashing of teeth and an outer darkness for a thousand years. The Bible says nothing of that. Who is the overcomer? There's one verse. I'm glad John was a simple man because he made it simple for me. First John chapter five, verse, verses four and five. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Here's the criteria, even our faith. Now, John says, just in case you didn't get that, let me give you one more sentence. Who is he that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So who is the overcomer according to John? Everyone, every believer who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. We are overcomers because we believe. It's not dependent upon our performance, but our position in Christ because of faith in him. Amen. Amen. That's so oh. that's so good. And and that mean, means even more because it's the same author, right? Revelation talks about overcomer. First yes. John talks about overcomer. Both by the, the over, John. Yeah. If I could say this, the overcomers in Revelation two and three, 
John wrote that book. So he's using the same concept that he defined in 1 John. And so some people try to say, well, these are different overcomers. No, they aren't. Those who believe in Jesus Christ by faith are overcomers. Yep. And we will share in the overcomers reward according to our faithfulness. Well, we've overcome this podcast. <laughs> uh, we're, I think we're just about done. What uh, time are we at, Gabriel? Yeah, we're just about an hour. Uh, but for those okay. for those listening, we talked about a lot, right? Talked about so much. This podcast has been awesome. Uh, but Where can you get this book? Besides the Word of Life library. Where yeah. Can... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's available on Amazon.com. You can get it as an ebook for $9.99. You can get a used copy because when I was at... Uh, uh, Liberty Seminary as an online professor for 13 years. Uh, later on, it became required reading for one of the theology courses. So it wasn't an ebook then, it was paperback. So students bought it. And now they put some of them on the internet to sell. You can buy a used copy or a brand new copy, which would do my heart good. <laughs> and so, as you can tell, ways to get the book. Gary and I have never done that. No, no, never, never sell ever. a book. Now, if you speak <laughs> Spanish, uh, in June or July, it's being put out by a Spanish publisher oh, nice. for all the Latin America market and for Spain. It'll be coming out in June or July. And also, if you're in India or Asia, uh, OM Books publishes it for all of uh, English-speaking Asia. Oh, Operation book. Mobilization. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And there's so much Thank more information. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. it was Thank our pleasure. It was yep. our pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Is there any yes, we left, other things? Oh, is there any other some, stuff we should know? Oh, no. We left some unanswered questions. Oh, yeah. But that's uh, why you need to get the book. I spent two yep. years researching it and writing. Let there me you know. just give you the thesis one more time. And after all this talk. It's a solemn evaluation at which there will be no judicial condemnation, nor will there be any judicial punishment for believers' sin, whether confessed or unconfessed sin, but rather commendation according to the faithfulness of each individual Christian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Sam. We pray, Lord, that you would bless his trips that he's got coming up this year to spread the gospel and to teach men and women to um be effective in ministry. We just pray, Lord, for his safety and his wife's safety on these trips. And we thank you, Lord, for his ministry over these many, many years and his ministry right here today. We're so grateful for his understanding of the judgment seat of Christ and his ability to explain it to those who do not know of it. Now we ask, Lord, that you would give us a good evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Amen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the book podcast if you liked what you heard and want to support us like follow subscribe on any podcasting platform on youtube on facebook instagram or twitter simply type in at hear the book pod at hear the book pod thank you see you next time